Okay, so let's get started. Um, please let me know in chat or through audio if you have any problems seeing the slides or any part of the presentation. Um, we're going to take about half an hour, maybe a little bit longer, um, to go through an introduction to TauDB. Um, we're going to be doing this as a hands-on uh, tutorial and also walking through notebooks with some more complex data so you can see what is possible. Um, I'd like to start by um, just showing you a few solutions and examples of the kind of things that you can do. Um, then we're going to go and go through the command line of how to use the open source TileDB Universal Data Engine. And then hopefully you, you have signed up for a cloud account. And if you've joined a little bit late, you'll see the information in the chat window. And then if you could also sign up for the Capella Space Community um, Developer Program. So our, our solutions. Um, Sorry, Norman. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The chat was on the slides. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so TileDB University Data Engine supports both dense and sparse multidimensional arrays. And for dense, if you're thinking, you can think of raster. And for sparse, you can think of point clouds, so things like LIDAR. And then for multidimensional, you can think the equivalents in uh, HDF or NetCDF, where you have multiple variables per data set. Uh, it's a powerful cloud native data storage engine. And cloud native is one of the reasons why we're all here today to go and discuss you know, alternatives to COG. And we also have a streaming interoperability through our open source APIs around Python, Go, uh, data science integrations, Maria Debris in, in, integrations, lots of cool things. You know, at our core, we're open source and we have a common open source data format. So if you were in my presentation earlier, you would have seen I showed this examples page. I, I just wanted to do a lead of it so you can see where we're, where, where we're going to get to in this presentation. Um, so you can see the animations there are using Capella star data. Um, we have a net CDF of temperature over time over the whole world from 1901 to 2014. Um, we have some data here from Pixel 8, who are also one of the sponsors, uh, showing point clouds in Boulder. We have a tree canopy and then also some AIS, so ship location data from the US Coast Guard. So in terms of using TileDB with our geospatial integrations, with GDAL, it's as simple as creating a GDAL environment. Um, I recommend you also install Python and you can install 3.6, 3.7 or 3.8. And if you wanted to run this now, then, then please do. And then you activate the GDAL environment and you install GDAL using Conda Forge, and it will come with the TileDB format driver already enabled. Okay, so let's give you a second there. So once you've done, done that, then you can just run the GDAL translate command, which is something I've, I imagine you're all familiar with if you've been using Stack. And we specify the output format driver to be TileDB, as in my highlight. Um, I've taken its example image, it's well known to GDAL, uh, UTM GTF, which is an image over Chicago, and you can find the link down the bottom. And then the output array is just a local folder in this case, but you could also make it uh, on cloud storage, such as S3, Google Cloud, or Azure. Then once you have created that array, you run uh, GDAL info on that to go and see the metadata. And I'm just going to do that for you now. So use this GDAL. Okay. So I'm going to remove the uh, output away, output array, so you can see me create it. Um, please let me know if you can't see the console. Uh, we cannot. We see the browser. Okay. All right. Let me let me stop share and reshare the whole my whole desktop. Thanks, Ahmed. Okay. Okay, so now you should be able to see the uh, the console. Yes. Okay. So that that command is GDAL translate, and we're going to go and move into Jupyter notebooks in a minute, and anybody's using visualizations. But at, at a core of most of our geospatial frameworks are the libraries GDAL and Poodle and REST area. So I just wanted to show you how you could do that. So we're going to create that output array, and you can see it was very very quick. So we we're taking a a um, a GeoTIFF here, which happens to be a cog because it's a single tile and we turn that into a TileDB array. And then we have a look at that output array with GDAL info. 
you can see that we captured all the geospatial metadata that you need to go to better go and interpret that image. So in this case, it's in UTM. Uh, you can see we copied over all the TIFF tags too. So if you, if you have a whole bunch of TIFF tag metadata that is available to you as a TileDB array. And then we have the, the standard WKT, the well-known text, which gives you the EPSG code. Okay. So that's GDAO. And as I was saying, you can also do the same thing with Rasterio. Uh, and Rasterio is kind of nice because it's, it's an easy to use Python library on top of GDAO. And then with Poodle, so Poodle is a, the point data extraction library, uh, which is open source. And we have a format driver, a plugin inside Poodle for taking LAZ, LAS, um, PG point cloud, uh, all sorts of point data that Poodle does work so well with and making these into TileDB arrays. And you can use any of the Poodle filters on top of that as well. So here we did the same thing. Using Conda, you can create a Poodle environment. You then activate that Poodle environment and you install Poodle using Condo again. And if you do that, then the TileDB plugin is already enabled for you. You know, and it goes without saying that we're very grateful to the developers of GDAO and Poodle for all the work that they do. And then we create a simple pipeline here on the right. We take the outsend or LAZ file. Um, we're going to order the data because ordering the data makes a significant difference to the performance of a universal data engine such as TileDB. And we're going to output yes as a TileDB array. So you use the pipeline. And then we're going to run this from the console as well. So there's, there's the one we just did with GeoTiff. And we're going to delete the output array, array. So we do it here. Okay, so that's just remove the local array. And we're going to run um, the pipeline here. So Poodle pipeline, that's the commands you need to use. And then the input pipeline that you want to run. And this takes a little bit more time. Okay. So we can see that, that that's going to be created here in a second. There we go, output array. And this is the, the fragments and the array schema. And I'm going to show you this all to you in a graphical user interface now. Okay. So if we go to our notebooks, and again, if you haven't signed up, please do in chat. We're going to walk through a couple of notebooks and I'm going to show you how a tile to be array looks, what the schema it has and how to explore your data using Python. And if you're signed up, you will find all of these examples are available to you under examples folder inside Jupyter Notebook, Geo and SAR, where my cursor is right now. Okay. So we talk a lot about how to be array, but to have an array, either sparse or dense, you need to have a schema. And um, this is a schema that we've taken from a net CDF data set from the British Atmospheric Data Center. So it's, it's sparse by nature. And we're not allowing, oh, sorry, dense by nature. And we're not allowing duplicates. Um, we were using CSTD compression on the coordinates, but you could use whatever you want. Um, you can have multiple attributes per pixel value, and you can compress each one of those differently as well. Um, we created this array using GDAO. So with GDAO, um, you have a concept of bands and then X and Y for Cartesian space. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a, a huge number of bands, 1,404 bands, and a relatively small geospatial um, dimension of uh, 360 and 720, because it's a net CDFR that's pretty common. So you have a half a degree resolution in X. Okay. Again, please stop me if you have any questions. Um, so we're using this data, which is from the Climate, climate Research Unit, uh, it's actually filtered up to BADC, British Atmospheric Data Center, uh, and it's available under the ODBL. Um, we're going to use our integration into REST area. And you can see that I have a TileDB URI here, which is a TileDB cloud URI, but the actual data is in cloud storage. So in this case, it's actually on Amazon S3. Okay. And then we look at that array here. 
we can see it's about 162 megabytes in size. It's sitting on S3, and uh, there's my URIs. Okay. So let's run this in real time. So we're just going to do the imports in Python. And you know, we were saying earlier that one of the key things about cloud native storage, uh, even with COGS, is that you want to be able to access the metadata so you can understand the image. So we're going to open this data set array here with REST area. And we're going to print out all the metadata, including the no data values for the source. But not just the metadata for the data set, also the metadata for each band. So if you think of a COG model, you can have a metadata for the data set. You can also have band level metadata. Okay. So yes, it's the data set level metadata. So the driver is TileDB, the no data value, which is always crucial when you're doing geospatial analysis, and the width and height, as we we're saying, was 720 by 360. But there are 1,404 bands. Then for each band, this is the metadata per band. And this includes the net CDF time values, which you can see there are well, 1,404 of those. And we know that they're that's a Gregorian calendar. So this is day since 1901. So that was using my stereo. But we can do the same thing with the TileDB Python library, which is also open source, and you can install that using Conda. And we print out the schema and the attributes, and we get a little bit more information about the internals of the TileDB array. Okay. So we're going to do a, create a, uh, a prototype of how to analyze this data set. So this is a Jupyter notebook accessing a an array that's stored on Amazon S3 on cloud storage. Okay. And we're going to prototype it. So we're just going to use a, a NumPy mean function, if you're familiar with NumPy. And we're going to dump out the first four days of 1901 from this model. And we're going to just do this one fairly quickly and then move on more to the LiDAR and the uh, data sets from Capella. Okay, so that's the first four days of 1901. So if we have a quick look at LIDAR, and then we'll move on to the Capella Space data sets. So I'm using some data here from uh, Pixel 8, uh, which is licensed as Creative Columns by 2.0. And we just ran a pipeline locally to go and create an output array. And I'm going to do the same thing here with a pointing to an endpoint, point tile endpoint. And we're going to write this out as a, uh, an array in my, in my bucket on, on S3. Okay, so again, we have to import, import the libraries we need. So Poodle, NumPy, TileDB, and then these are your plotting libraries. And then I could run a user defined function here. So I'm running inside a notebook. I'm probably going to need an, another instance that has a lot more memory and processing power to go and run stats over a complete image. And I can run that as a user defined function. And then here you'll see my plotting function where I want to go and do a portrayal of RGB of this particular point cloud. So my actual array is here, is the image over Boulder. And I'm going to access, yes, it's a sparse array because it's a point cloud. And I'm going to print out the non empty domain and then I'm going to plot it. Okay, so let's do that here. So here's my non empty domain. So my non empty domain is my actual area on the earth where I actually have data. So a sparse array could be unlimited, go from minus infinity to infinity in, in all two dimensions. So I went to cloud storage, I retrieved the data, I now have that set. And I'm going to do a plot of years. Okay, so here I see a, a storefront uh, on Pearl Street Mall. Okay, so if you look in chat, please do sign up for the Capella Developer Program uh, as well as TileDB Cloud, and you'll be able to access uh, uh, SAR data um, that Capella has been collecting over the last few months. Um, I've had a, a great pleasure of working with Jason Brown for the last 18 months or so on creating these notebooks, so a lot of the credit should go to him. Um, earlier on in the 
in the presentation, I gave you a, a visualization of a SAR change analysis, and I'm gonna show you here how to create a time series GIF directly from cloud storage using TileDB. So we're gonna to go to S3, read out a bounding box from that array, and then stack it in time and iterate over it and create, create a GIF or, or an MPEG, depending on which one you wanna do. So again, I do my imports. Um, I'm setting up a few simple um, properties here. So my filter is my bounding box area that I, I want to look at. And in this case, it's an area over Rotterdam. And here we're actually accessing Compiler's stack catalog to go and find out the uh, IDs of the image that we want, images we want to display. And then those images are stored as TileDB arrays in, uh, in our cloud storage. So here we're gonna make a stack query. Um, as you do this, you have these notebooks available to you and you just need to create your credentials file, which is documented when you log in. So it's a slight pause here as it goes and makes that query. And then we're gonna use Rasterio. We're gonna sort the time series. We're gonna take the bounds, which are in that long and make them into native bounds. We're then gonna read directly from a TileDB array, those particular bounds that we want. We're gonna update the no data value, which I was saying before is important. So we need to be able to read the metadata and then we're gonna go and create an animation. So this is running now. The actual access is quite fast. The uh, creating the animation for Matplotlib takes a little bit of time. Okay. So we'll, we'll let that run for a few seconds and we'll come back to that. Okay. So in this notebook, um, there's a whole bunch of views actually, I think that one just completed there. So there's the animation over time. That's what I was saying, the, the bulk of that time was uh, in creating the animation, not retrieving the data, as we saw earlier when we were accessing the data sets for the LiDAR case. So within our notebook, we're displaying a video we created. So we also wanna show you like time series activity. So, you know, we wanna do something a bit more meaningful rather than just doing a, a, a pretty video. We actually wanna do some proper analysis. And again, we can do that within a notebook. Um, with Python. So we're going to import the, li the libraries we need. Uh, and we have integrations, as you can see, into all the standard libraries. So once we've integrated into Rasterio through GDEL, we can start doing things with NumPy, with um, scikit-image, scipy, pretty much everything you can think of in the Python um, infrastructure. Uh, and as I was saying in the talk earlier, we could also do use SQL, so we could do all these queries with SQL. So we're gonna set up our project variables. And we're gonna inspect the AOI in the map. And as you can see, it, we're at an area in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And we're gonna um, query Capella for the available features. So let's go and run that query. And this is querying Capella's stack catalog. Okay, so we just did that. Uh, we're going to sort those features in time. And we're going to open the first image and inspect the histogram. Uh, okay. Oh, I needed to load the, uh, the properties one second, so my apologies. So we load the properties.
And now we actually go and open that image. You can see how fast it was in this case. So we went to cloud storage, created tower to be away, got the data back we needed. And now we're doing a simple histogram. And then from there, we set a threshold and we count the pixels above the threshold. And we, and we plot those over time. So this is giving us our activity index so we can kind of know which images we should be looking at, which star images. And we're gonna compare that directly to the time series imagery. So we could do this in the graph here. I created a video as before. The red dot is showing you which image is linked on the right. And this is directly from a TileDB array. So the SAR data is complex data. Um, you could model this as uh, COGS, um, but you'd struggle with the time series part of it. And I think this is where TileDB is, is great for this kind of data in that we can create a time series spatial temporal cube and you can slice over time and also over X and Y or you know, uh, geographic dimensions. Okay. So all of these notebooks are open source as well. So if you don't want to sign up to how to be cloud, you can find them on uh, Capella Spaces, GitHub, Repay. Okay, so the final one um, is we wanted to show how you could do uh, like a mosaicing and merging of different star images and, and make them look pretty. And because um, when you're doing merging, it's, it's you're trying to get um, visually acceptable uh, results. Um, as well as scientifically, scientifically correct, you want them to visually look good. Um, so we made a few updates to the Rasterio library to support merging over bands by creating stacks. And in this notebook, um, again, you have to import the modules that you need. And then we're gonna pull the bounding box from a JSON file, which is just stored here on the left if you wanted to, to look at it. So it's just a standard uh, GeoJSON-like um, filter. And we're gonna query the stack catalog from uh, Capella to go and find the data sets that match that filter. Okay, that just ran. And this context manager is a little bit of Python code just to help with um, the memory management within a notebook. Um, you don't have to do it this way. You can just make it a little bit simpler if you want to. So we're going to average all the data sets. So we've gone to, we've gone to Capella with a filter and said, and said, return all the uh, star images that match this filter. And I now want to do a merge on the, on those. Um, we're going to use an additional band as a counter. So um, we're going to stack the images up and then flatten them to go and create the merge. Okay, and then we can see that here. And then that's one way of doing it, but it's very memory intensive. How about if we do a stack average? And I should also add that um, these, these results are just something that Jason and I were trying. It's not representative of uh, the, um, any image quality thing that you should be taking, taking from this. It's just showing how to do the code. Um, so if we do a stack average, we use a lot less memory. Uh, and we can do that again with the, the rest area merge uh, update that we made. So here we call rest area merge and we pass in our function stack average. And this is also creating a mean image. Okay, and then how about we do it with a signal to noise ratio weighted average instead? So again, we call merge and we pass in a, a different function, in this case, uh, stack average. And we do a, an a SNR based approach. So I'm showing you here how even though your tile to be array, which is complex data over time, is stored in S3, it's complex SAR data over time stored in S3. You can just use a Jupyter notebook and tile to be cloud to go and do your analysis really, really easily. And I think this is what we're all trying to do with cloud-native data storage. We're trying to make 
you know, as uh, Chris was saying in his presentation this morning, we're streaming the data once rather than having to download all that data set. Again, there's a different approach. So we're at the 330 mark and um, we we're gonna stop at 340. Um, hopefully you've been able to follow along with some of this, uh, at least uh, the console parts of it as well. Um, do we have any, any questions on the, on the chat or anyone who wants to jump in with a question? Okay, um, this, is, this is an opportunity to, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do something uh, yourself, just to jump in and ask. Okay, I'm going to put uh, Hamid on the spot. Hamid, do, do, do you have any questions? Okay, uh, well, then, in that case, um, thank you all um, ever so much for your time. Um, I've enjoyed giving his presentation and I, you know, I hope to please follow up with me uh, directly or through letertiretb.com and go through our chat window and talk to someone um, as well. And um, yeah, it's been a very good sprint and we've been very pleased to sponsor. Thank you everyone.